like to uh, especially welcome our back row there. The, these guys are of the age where they always sit in the back row. I remember doing that in, in high school, but I didn't want to watch anything. But anyway, that's another story. So, uh, got a good crew. Uh, I'm going to introduce the next guy. I've known him for a long time. Uh, he's real good looking. <laughs> he's, uh, he's very intelligent. Uh, I see. Well, it's me. So I'm Dennis Stromberg. I'm going to talk about John Looker. And the reason we're going to talk about him is everybody knows about this road. <coughs> and it's a very interesting story how that road happens. So I'll start out with, uh, he, he was a good example of, a, of one of our oil producers. I don't think he ever drilled a well. I think he just bought them. <laughs> he was born in 1854 in New Richmond, Crawford County. He was born in a log cabin and he, on his father's farm, and uh, I think he got an eighth grade education at the best. And he trained to be a carpenter. In 1876, he married uh, Sarah Putnam. If you look up the genealogy, it looks like they got married twice. I think one of them was wrong. They say they either got married at 21 or 15. I'm going with 21. <laughs> so, um, he married Sarah Putnam, who was down the street from him. Uh, she was, uh, it's interesting, her father was a direct descendant of Israel Putnam, who was one of the first settlers of the Connecticut Valley. He was a general in the Revolutionary War, and he fought in the French and Indian War. What's great about him, he is the guy who was in charge at Bunker Hill. And he got to say, don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. So what a great line. Um, also, the Putnam family can trace itself back to um, the Earl of Putnam, who was mentioned in the Doomsday Book, which was the first census taken in England. Here's, that's Mr. Looker. Here we are at the Battle of Bunker Hill. But also, I threw this in. To use, we've talked about three or four times where everybody's laughed, so I said, well, it's, Miss, Mr. Looker also ended up in Tidu, and he was a, uh, that's where he and his wife first moved. After six months in Tidu, they couldn't stand it. It was just too busy. <laughs> so they decided they'd move to uh, Summit in the King County. Does anybody know where Summit is? Summit is, um, you know where the racetrack is? That's Summit. And in 1887, when my grandmother was born there, there was five hotels and a population of 15,000. So things have changed. Here's Summit and, and his best pictures. Fine looking place. In 1881, Mr. Looker decided to get into the toil business, and he formed a partnership with J.M. Winger. Is that anybody's relative? They, in Smith Hollow, near Duke Center, they had a well, and then they had two. Two years later, he bought out his partner from that, from that point on. He just would uh, buy wells as people sold them. He, uh, he, what, he bought wells mainly between Rue Summit and Duke Center. And he called it, it got to be called uh, the Tip Top Oil Field. And there was a town name there for a while, too, Tip Top. It was named for his oil field. 
Uh, he got out of the business in 1925. Uh, he, uh, by that time, he had accumulated about uh, 243 wells and 1,000 acres of leased land for rental rights. He sold it to a, uh, a group of investors out of New York City. He sold it for $1.4 million, which sure sounds nice, but that's what he sold it for. Now I'll give you today's dollars, and you feel a lot better for him. <laughs> so he was all right. In uh, 1927, at the 6th International Petroleum Expedition in Congress in Tulsa, Oklahoma, he was honored with the title of Grand Old Man of the Oil Industry. And to commemorate this honor, he received a gold medallion from a guy named John D. Rack Rockefeller. So I don't know if that means he was a friend of Rockefeller's or, or Rockefeller just gave it to him because he probably was on the independent uh, side of the uh, drillers. He uh, bought this place. <laughs> he, he owned that from uh, 1925 until he died in uh, in in, uh, in 37. <coughs> but uh, you all know that building. It's been around for a while. Uh, he decided after he sold his, that he was going to get into the uh, real estate business. And this is one of the things he bought. Um, he uh, bought it from a guy by the name of Fulton, who had owned it for six months after buying it from the Hollies. The Holly uh, Hotel was completed in 1902. It was one of the finest hotels in the region. It was, it, it was fireproof, which at that time, everything was burning down all the time because they were using uh, wood. and. And of course, the heated and everything they were using for fire. Uh, the only uh, wood used in the whole building was the door and the window frames and the and the doors. So, window frames, door frames, and the doors were everything else was not wood. And uh, Holly sold it in 1928 to a guy Robert Fulton who had who had a hotel in St. Petersburg, Florida. And he moved up here, and he, he, he had it from June, June 28, and Booker bought it in September 29, which if you think that's, what, one month before the, uh, or one or two months before the stock market crash. He kept Mr. Fulton on as a manager, and I mentioned Mr. Fulton because you may have heard of a building called the Hooker Fulton Building. He was he owned that half of it. In uh, September 1930, Looker announced he would spend $110,000 back then upgrading the hotel. The major upgrades were he added a one floor, taking it from 86 rooms to 100 rooms. When you go by it next, you'll see Look up there, you can see there, there, this is before the, the other floor was added, but when you go by the, the hotel, you can see the floors above what used to be the roof line. He uh, had the dining room redesigned and enlarged a modern coffee shop, a new lobby and entrance, new faster elevator. Oh. And, and this is really important, baths and showers added to almost all the rooms. So, <laughs> if you think about it, that hotel is still in use. It was built in 1905. He, uh, he had a few other... He ended up owning 43, or I think it's 43, 
different things. I, if you can see this, he may have owned one of your houses. <laughs> so. Then this is an, this is another story to tell about what kind of a guy he was. Um, he um, wrote a letter to the Bradford City Planning Commission. He said, "I have long realized that the street fronting the hospital grounds, which would have been uh, from Pleasant Street to Interstate Parkway." and the approaches are not in keeping with the splendid hospital which we have, we enjoy. Therefore, with the cooperation of the city and hospital directors, I desire to build a 32 foot wide reinforced concrete street from Bennett Street to Interstate Parkway, and I will pay for it. Well, that's pretty nice. You can see the street was not one of your favorite streets to drive down unless you have a Jeep. So, um, another thing that was interesting is uh, he got involved with what was new then, the King County Fair. And he was on the, on the, on the uh, committee that put it together. And one of the things he did, he was the um, secretary and they decided it decided they needed a new um, grandstand and an exhibition hall. So he put in most of the money for it, not all of it, but most of it, to get it built. The total cost was uh, ten thousand dollars back then, okay. which, which was I don't know what now. So the uh, lookers had a lot of friends. <coughs> they, uh, there, here's the hospital in the 1930s. I please leave. This is his wife's picture. She deserves it when I tell you this. The lookers had a lot of friends and they liked to entertain. For example, in 1923, they held a St. Patrick's Day party at their home in Summit. It was said that every adult from Rexford and Summit and people from Bradford and Tuna were there. So he had, uh, they figured it was over 100 people for, for their party, which they held in their home. In uh, 1926, they hosted a reunion of the Putnams, the Mrs. Looker's standard Putler, Putnam family at their house in Congress Street. There were about 175 guests for dinner. And the very next day, just for practice, they celebrated their 50th anniversary with a party of 300. <laughs> Try that out. <laughs> So, they were they were into the into the into the uh, style of the of some of the people in this town. This is their house on on Congress Street at the corner. Of, this is a, today's picture, not today's, but in the modern picture. This it's on the corner of Kane and Congress. Okay, um, my parents were married in that house. That's my connection to it. Uh, I'm gonna go back here. <coughs> I'm gonna talk about Looker Mountain Trail now. You have to know what was happening in the 1920s. We did not have a road system in the United States. There was a, there was a, um, it was kind of driven locally. For example, there was a, 
a group called the P and B Road Association. Now that was the Pittsburgh to Buffalo Road, which was 219, and that P and B Road Association made sure that there was a road up 219, and got it to be a federal uh, federal road with the with the number and everything. So you had to, you, a local group would say, we'd like a road from here to here. And then, and that didn't mean it happened. You could say that. And then they would say, well, you know, we, basically the st states were against it because it gave more responsibilities. They had to take care of it. They had to build it. They had to, you know, plan it out and everything. So when you come to this, the, the road, it's the Looker Mountain Trail had two things against it. It was not wanted by the state. They didn't want to take the responsibility for it. And it was not wanted by the Duke Mountain Association, which had a road from Derrick City to Duke Center. And they didn't, they didn't want the competition of another road. So they were against it. And the and the Duke the road from Derrick City to Duke Center had a number. So it was the official road. If you didn't have a number, you weren't on the map. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what you wanted to do is get your road built. You wanted to get it uh, a number and get on the state road map. Otherwise it wasn't a road. It was just your 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 area's road. So this was not an easy thing to do, so what, uh, I'll have to read you, this is from the, um, Mr. A.D. Burns, uh, President of the Bradford Board of Commerce, and um, this is him telling about how they got the road done. He says, uh, he says, at midnight, between the hours of 12 and 1, we were called upon by the, by the Prince, John C. Looker, to meet at his residence in Summit. He gathered his forces. His Lieutenant James C. Fraser was called onto the rallies in, in, to rally his forces and to meet at Summit with us. When the writer and the attorney arrived at Looker's, we found assembled in the road a 40-ton truck, a large caterpillar tractor, and a span of mules with a hay rack on a wagon. We were told to get into the wagon, into the hay rack, and the prince, John C. Looker, told the truck man and the tractor man to follow him and the mules started. We went to Coralville, bobbing over wet that rough road, and believe it, believe we were hanging for, on for our dear lives part of the time. Across the railroad looking towards Champion Hill and from Champion Hill down to Turtle Point. The prince leading the way. From here we went about somewhere near two o'clock in the morning with stars shining and moon lighting the way, the mules going in front and the truck and the caterpillar rallying behind. And I don't, I think, I don't quite understand what he's going to say here, but I think I do. He says, we loaded up parts of Route 100 into the truck. We hitched on, onto the rear with the caterpillar and the mules hooked up to the truck and we all, and we all had orders to get back on the hay rack. We started, we had Route 100 hooked up. I think they took the, some of the concrete sections and took them out and took the signs and then, they kept, and then they went back and built the road. So it became Highway 100. And uh, that was from the president of the Bradford Board of Commerce. So they, uh, that's amazing. They, it, that's where they had to do it. Um, it was a, there was a, uh, all of these, most of these associations 
belonged uh, to a, a, a an association uh, across the United States called the Good Road Association. It was a private a private uh, association of, with uh, people who like good roads. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of people with cars that liked it because there wasn't any roads then. I mean, up to then, you'd come to a road that came to the end of a state, it would stop here, and the next one started down here in the next state because that's where they did it. There was no coordination. So this Good Roads Association had, had some people like, uh, here's some names from the uh, their uh, board. Uh, one was uh, <coughs> Ford. Another one was, uh, uh, was it the uh, Stu Studebaker? And all these guys were working really hard to have roads to run their cars on. But uh, anyway, they got they got the road finally in. Oh, I forgot to add another thing. Then they they laid it out, and then he, he paid for it to be paved and taken care of for three years. Just to, so I, he deserves, I guess, to have the name of the road. Another of his uh, acts of philanthropy was not in our area. He had grown up near the farm, which was the home of John Brown and his family for 20 years. Now uh, that's the John Brown, if we can all sing John Brown is molded in the grave. No, we won't do that. <laughs> but it was the John Brown, what I consider of Harper's Ferry, who would, who would um, tried to start a revolution with the black people. Uh, he, he, uh, he felt that the farm should be protected and should be a uh, national monument of some sort. So um, he uh, bought the farm and then he uh, tried to get the state to make it uh, like a small state park, but they wouldn't do it. But he got them to put up the, uh, the the blue historical plaque in 1918. And here's the farm. Here's, he, had a, he had a tannery there. That's his tannery. This is today, and that is when it was working. That's what's up there now. He took care of all that. He bought it. He, he fought for it. So. Anyway, you can see that he was a, a very thoughtful guy about, about his, where he worked and where he lived and wanted to make sure it was a nice place. Anything else? Any questions?